Six years of hard training and actual battle experience in Spain and Poland had made the German army look invincible. But what about the British and French? First, let's take up the British. They started from scratch, but both at home and abroad, an army was growing. For not only Britain had declared war, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the whole British Commonwealth of Nations was also determined on victory over Hitlerism and all it stands for. And Britain had one weapon that was ready, the Royal Navy. Shortly after war was declared, it had swept German shipping from the high seas. And units of the British fleet were deployed at Suez, Malta, Gibraltar, in the Channel, and in the North Sea, blockading Germany. World conquest was impossible without running smack up against the rock called Britain. How to strike at that little island? That was the question. Between Britain and Germany stood not only France, but the little countries of Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. The people of these small neutral countries were peaceful, hardworking, and free. They knew they were in the middle, and feared violation of their neutrality. Hitler knew this. He also knew that if they united with the Allies, they would form a solid democratic wall against Nazi aggression, and their conquest would be far more difficult. So before striking with his armies, he used another weapon, the propaganda barrage, to confuse, to make them lose faith, to divide and conquer. To lull the fears of the little neutrals, propaganda minister Goebbels told them Germany didn't want a war at all. It was Britain and France that caused all the trouble. Then it was Hitler's turn. In a speech on October 6, 1939, he made them all kinds of specific promises. To the Danes, he said, we have concluded a non-aggression pact with Denmark. To the Norwegians, he said, Germany never had any conflict with the northern states and has none today. To the Dutch, he said, the new Reich has endeavored to continue the traditional friendship with Holland. And to the Belgians, he announced, the Reich has put forth no claim which might in any way be regarded as a threat to Belgium. And while Hitler was making these promises, his generals were cold-bloodedly picking out the first victim. Norway. And why did they pick Norway? Its many steep inlets or fjords would make excellent U-boat bases from which raiders could prey on British supply lines. Also, it would give the Nazis vital air bases. This is Stapa Flo, British naval base, and this the blockade fleet. At this time, the German base bombers couldn't reach them. Possession of bases on Norway's western shore would bring these vital British defenses under easy bomber attack. But he couldn't take Norway without also taking tiny Denmark, the springboard for his attack. So at dawn on April 9, 1940, the German army rolled across the neutral borders of little Denmark, and in a matter of hours it occupied the entire country. By nightfall, Denmark is erased as a nation, and the Danes go into slavery. Although only six months before, Hitler had announced, we have concluded a non-aggression pact with Denmark. The Danes will not forget.
Meanwhile, in Norway, peaceful-looking German merchant ships like these had sneaked inside Norway's neutral waterway and tied up at all principal ports. That is, they looked like merchant ships. But if the Norwegians had had X-ray eyes, this is what they would have seen. The Trojan horse of ancient Greece brought up to date with new and deadlier weapons. At the precise moment that the Nazis overran Denmark, these quiet-looking ships sprang to life. At the same time, Nazi warships, discovered along the entire coastline, started steaming up the Norwegian fjords. Ships, transports, tanks, men, planes, all flung themselves simultaneously upon a defenseless country. Airborne infantry seized every strategic Norwegian airport. The whole job was made easier by treacherous fifth columnists, led by Major Quisling, who seized power and issued orders to suppress resistance. Nazi warships steamed past silent guns that could have blasted them out of the water. This was one of the most amazing acts of treachery the world has ever known. It brought Major Quisling international fame, making his very name synonymous with the word traitor. By the afternoon of April 9th, the Germans were in complete control of all seven ports where they had landed in the morning. For the first time in more than 200 years, the people of Norway saw an invading army parading through their cities. Many of these Nazi soldiers, strutting as conquerors in 1940, had last seen Norway some 20 years earlier, when, as refugee German children, they had been raised and cared for by kind Norwegians. Now these same Germans were back to repay that kindness with terror and destruction. Once they had occupied the capital, the Nazis quickly fanned out in all directions. But loyal Norwegian troops stopped one German column between Hamar and Elvera. So the Germans brought up their bombers. Norwegians were forced to flee to the north under constant and unopposed air attack. It was here that Captain Robert Lose, an American military attaché, was killed, the first American soldier to lose his life in this war. Meanwhile, the Nazis had spread all over the country. Small patrols occupied every strategic village. Parachute troops landed high in the mountains. Unopposed bombing raids sent defenseless civilians fleeing in stark terror. They hadn't wanted war. They had done everything to avoid it. Hoping they could escape the Nazi scourge, they had compromised and tragically failed to unite with the other democracies. And now they faced the scourge defenseless and alone. For before the Allies could come to their aid, the Germans were in control of all principal ports. Regardless of this, British, French, and Polish contingents plunged in and made several landings along the Norwegian coast. They landed forces north and south of Trondheim and attempted an encircling movement on the city under constant, heavy, 
an almost entirely unopposed air attack. Well, the scene of action was out of range of British fighter planes. So they brought up aircraft carriers. But these are at a disadvantage when opposed by land-based planes. The Allies, therefore, were badly battered from the air. Finally, suffering heavy losses, they withdrew from a hopeless situation. Further to the north, at Narvik, they met with better success, inflicting heavy naval losses on the Nazis. landings and held the town for nearly two months. Incidentally, they also took their first prisoners of the present war. But again, the Nazis' overwhelming air superiority proved a deciding factor. And the Allies were forced to withdraw under terrific air bombardment. were left with their quizbings, their ruins, their dead. Even though six months before Hitler had said, Germany never had any conflict with the northern states and has none today. The Norwegians will not forget. And Hitler, Hitler had another victory. He had hijacked two more countries. The world wondered and sometimes marveled at this man's efficiency. Gangster Dillinger was efficient too. When a man or a nation throws away all regard for the laws of God and man, he is bound at first to be more efficient than his victims. Society had a police force to deal with Gangster Dillinger, but it had no police force to deal with Gangster Hitler. So he clubbed Norway into submission and got what he wanted, bases for use against Britain. Now he had the northern claw of an enormous pincer movement. A drive through France would give him the southern claw. Blockade by U-boats coupled with mass bombing attacks would weaken the British for final invasion. Then, with Britain gone, Germany could reach out in all directions for world conquest. His next move must obviously be through France to get his southern claw. Through France. How was she to face the onslaught? These scenes are ancient history. They occurred in 1914. The German armies, without warning, had smashed across neutral Belgium, invaded France, reached the River Marne only a few miles from Paris. Out of the French capital poured the French reserves, riding out to battle the enemy in every vehicle that could move. The famous taxicab army. Note well, it was riding out to battle. In the center of the French line stood the 9th French Army, commanded by a then comparatively unknown general. On September 5th, 1914, he is reputed to have said, my right is driven in, my center is giving way. The situation is excellent, I attack. He 
did attack. The German onslaught was checked and Paris was saved. That comparatively unknown general later became commander-in-chief of all the Allied armies and presided at the signing of the armistice with the defeated Germans on November 11, 1918. To this general, the French people erected a monument. To Marshal Ferdinand Foch, whose motto was, attack, always attack. Still later, the war-weary French people erected another monument. This one to a minister of war, Andre Maginot. Between the ideas symbolized by these two statues may well lie the military story of the fall of a great nation. In Foch's time, the proud spirit of France demanded nothing less than victory and placed its faith in the attack. In Maginot's time, the spirit no longer proud asked only to avoid defeat and placed its faith in concrete. So the French built the mighty chain of fortresses called the Maginot Line. These tremendous bastions were built deep into the French land. They were connected by underground passages and railways, guarding France's eastern borders facing Germany. And when France was finally forced to declare war against the rising Nazi menace, the French troops, instead of attacking, were marched into their modern caves to wait for the Nazi blitz to smash itself against the Maginot Line. And their generals, headed by Marshal Pater, proudly announced, whoever makes the first move in this war will be hurt. But Hitler didn't go near the Maginot Line. That was France's strong point. Instead, he attacked the weak point. Hitler knew that the French had tried to avoid war instead of preparing for it. That knowledge was one of his greatest weapons. He knew they had planes, but he knew they were antiquated. He knew they had tanks, but he knew they were few in number and lightly armored. But most important of all, he knew that France had become a cynical and disillusioned nation. What made this change in the French spirit? In the first place, between 1914 and 1918, the French suffered more than six million casualties in the heroic defense of their land against German invasion. The flower of an entire generation was lost with its stimulus of new blood, new determination, new ideals. Secondly, the failure of the League of Nations to which the French had pinned their hopes of peace the corruption of many in high places, the greed of special interests, all had combined to shake the faith of the French people in their democratic ideals. And when a people loses its faith in its own ideals, it is ripe for the insidious words of the devil. France still looked like an imposing castle, but Hitler's political termites had so gnawed away the binding of national unity that the castle was ready to crumble. During those months of military inactivity that we called the Phony War, a ceaseless barrage of German propaganda crossed the still waters of the Rhine to affect the soldiers in the Maginot Line. Why do you fight, asked the banners. Poems and friendly notes were sent over by balloons. French tunes were played by German bands and German hui was broadcast in French. The British will fight to the last drop of French blood. You have been deceived. This is an imperialistic war for Britain. We Germans want nothing of France. What is happening to your wives back home, soldiers? The British are stationed in your villages. Yes, France was ready to be plucked. The whole force of the Nazi might was turned toward the West. 
How would they strike this time? Through Alsace-Lorraine, as in 1870? Through the Low Countries, as in 1914? What was the 1940 model conquest? The French considered the Maginot Line utterly impregnable, and therefore believed the Germans would again try a swing through the Low Countries, as in 1914. But even after Hitler's rape of Scandinavia, Holland and Belgium, hoping against hope, still clung to their neutrality. So the French massed 78 divisions here along the border of Belgium. 17 were in the Maginot Line. 10 divisions here in case Mussolini got bold. Three and a half as a safeguard against Spain. The British had 10 divisions here. The Allied strategy in the event of an attack against the Low Countries was to swing their armies like a gate into Belgium the hinge being the north end of the Maginot Line. This all-important hinge was protected by the forest of the Ardennes, a hilly and thickly wooded area, honeycombed with streams, its roads narrow trails, its bridges too weak for military vehicles. French strategists estimated the forest of the Ardennes impassable for armored forces. As you will see, this was one of the costliest estimates in all military history. That was the situation on May 9th, 1940. The hour of trial had come. The people of the democracies prayed for strength to meet the coming hurricane of terror. Well, across the Rhine. Juden ist uns verschrieben und verfallen mit Leib. A delirious madness possessed the German nation. Nun als Dauererscheinung für uns, unser Oberster, wird die Einführung der Allgemeinen immer wieder herniedersteigen und dass man die Wahrheit über Deutschland berichtet. 50.000 Mann auf den Baustellen der ganz Deutschland erfasste überall herrscht seit einem Jahr Regen und für den deutschen Eck. Die Reinheit seine Rasse hält. Hitler aber ist Deutschland wie Deutschland deshalb innerlich nicht zu uns gehört. <lacht> bothering to declare war, the German armies launched a coordinated attack across the neutral borders of Luxembourg, Belgium, and Holland, from the Maginot Line north to the sea. The action along the entire front was simultaneous, so for purposes of clarity, let's take up one country at a time. First, let's see what happened in Holland. The ground forces smashed through the improvised and hastily erected border defenses. But the main attack was to come from the air, far behind the defense lines.
over ten thousand troops were landed in this manner before the stunned citizens of rotterdam even knew they were at war these troops aided by well trained fifth columnists quickly captured the airport and outlying sections of the city meantime nazi armored columns were racing across the country their progress speeded by other fifth columnists who prevented the destruction of vital dikes and bridges. These forces affected a meeting with the parachutists landed in Rotterdam. The Dutch were doomed to defeat. On the fourth day of the invasion, the Nazis gave the Dutch general an ultimatum. All Dutch resistance must cease or Rotterdam will be bombed flat. Dutch general had little choice. To save the lives of innocent civilians, he accepted the German terms. But after the unconditional surrender, the Nazis bombed the city anyway. Flights of unopposed German bombers flew low over the center of Rotterdam and methodically bombed it into a heap of rubble. ruthless exhibitions of savagery the world has ever seen. Over 30,000 men, women, and children were killed in the space of 90 minutes. Though only six months before, Hitler had said, the new Reich has endeavored to continue the traditional friendship with Holland. The Dutch will not forget. Meantime, in Belgium, the whole force of Nazi Blitzkrieg had stormed across its neutral borders. The main German attack was directed at the Albert Canal Meuse River line, the anchor of which was Fort Eben Emael, a modern and seemingly impregnable fortress. The Germans had secretly built a replica of the mighty fortress in Czechoslovakia and had rehearsed the attack until they knew every detail of the fort's construction and its every weakness. When the real attack came, it was foolproof. Parachute troops, dive bombers, plane throwers, specially trained engineer battalions, all working together as a well-trained team. They knew exactly where to cross the river.
notice that this assault engineer knows exactly where to put his high explosive charge in order to destroy the blockhouse. Fort Eben a male withstood the Nazi attack exactly two days and the German armies rolled on. Meantime, an hour and a half after the German invasion began, Allied troops crossed the French and Belgian border to meet the advancing Germans. As they raced across Belgium to take up their defense positions, they met an obstacle they hadn't counted on. Refugees. And the refugee-choked roads didn't get that way by accident. The Nazis methodically bombed little towns and villages, otherwise devoid of any military value, not so much to kill as to drive the inhabitants out onto the highways. Then, by expert machine gunning, the Nazis would herd them along in terror-stricken flight to hopelessly entangle the advancing Allied armies. Refugees used as a weapon of war, a new low in inhumanity. school today, the sign says. The children are otherwise occupied. <coughs> no, no school today. Although only six months before, Hitler had announced the Reich has put forth no claim which might in any way be regarded as a threat to Belgium. The Belgians will not forget. And what about the Allies? They were convinced that the German attack on Belgium and Holland was the main thrust, and according to plan, had swung their armies like a gate into Belgium. But the attack on Belgium and Holland was only a feint. The main German attack was to be centered where the Allies least expected it, through the Ardennes forest. 
For this decisive blow, they had secretly assembled the mightiest striking force the world had ever seen, including 45,000 armored vehicles. At the same time that the Nazi armies were plunging into Holland and Belgium, this column started to move. Trained engineer battalions went first. They were opposed only by scattered Allied patrols. cleared pathways for the tanks to follow. Germans' armored force reached the Meuse River, two days faster than the French thought any troops could get through. By all rules, the Germans should have paused here to bring up heavy artillery before attempting to force the river. But the Nazis had a new type of artillery, dive bombers. With them, they blasted the French positions across the Meuse. With feverish haste, the Germans laid a barrage across the river with anything and everything that would shoot. This concentration of firepower continued all through the night. By the following day, shock troops were able to get across the river. until the engineers brought up pontons and built bridges. Then, without wasting a moment, Across these bridges, the main armored force of the German military machine rolled through to Sedan. 
for the all-important breakthrough into a dismayed and flat-footed France. There went the old ball game for the Allies. From here on, it was only a matter of how long. Watch the map as one of our intelligence officers explains the details of the German breakthrough. We speak of the breakthrough at Sedan, but actually the break was along a wide front extending for 50 miles from Namur in Belgium to Sedan. Further north, the Allied armies had swung like a gate into these positions. The German armies had swept over Holland, broken the line of the Albert Canal, and for all anyone knew, were preparing to smash against the Allied front with all their power. That was the situation, dangerous but obscure, on the evening of May 13th. On the 14th and 15th, it became clear that the German breakthrough south of Namur was in the greatest strength, and that the French 9th Army, attacked while moving into position, had been shattered. Without doubt, this was the point of mortal danger, and the French high command ordered the abandonment of these positions, although they had not yet been attacked. Those positions were abandoned solely because of the situation developing along the Meuse near Sedan. In the meantime, the French 7th Army had been ordered to make its historic forced march far to the south into the area threatened by the rapidly advancing German spearheads. This army was not used to attack the German flank, but rather was used as a plug to restore the broken front. Throughout, the Allies had placed their faith not in offense, but in defense and the defense was doomed to failure because it was confronted with an entirely new technique in warfare, the plain tank infantry team in action. The world was staggered by the speed with which the German armored columns moved. What was the secret that enabled armies to move so far so rapidly? The secret lay in the organization of the striking spearhead. Armored forces came first, closely followed by motorized divisions which peeled off, forming solid walls. And through the corridor thus formed, raced the supply trucks to feed the ever-lengthening column. It was obvious that if the Allied situation was to be restored, the German column would have to be cut. On May 17th, General de Gaulle attacked the German flank and captured a few prisoners but his light mechanized forces were like a pin pricking the side of a rhinoceros. A subsequent attack met with even less success. The means for a really successful counterattack against the German corridor simply did not exist. Where numbers of divisions were required, only handfuls of companies and battalions were available. A valiant attempt to cut the German corridor was made by a group of slow-moving British tanks just south of Ara. But lack of sustained striking power doomed this valiant unit to destruction. On May 21st, the German spearhead reached the channel port of Abbeville. Protecting their flank along the Somme, the Germans fanned out to the north and east. This was to be the perfect battle of annihilation. On May 28th, the Belgian army, compressed into a small space and weary of battle, lay down its arms. That left the desperate French and British defenders with their backs to the sea at the small channel port of Dunkirk. One of the greatest disasters in history seemed in the making. An entire British army faced annihilation. But out of the fog and the mist shrouding the channel came a strange armada of navy craft, fishing boats, pleasure yachts, anything that would float. The seagoing people of Britain had come to rescue their army. High overhead British fighter planes fought the Luftwaffe to a standstill. below, small allied suicide units held the German pack long enough 
for the miracle of Dunkirk to take place. Two hundred and eleven thousand five hundred British troops, plus one hundred and twelve thousand five hundred French and Belgian, were rescued. Over three hundred thousand battle-tested men, grimly determined to go back again with new tools, new weapons with which to blast the hated Nazis out of this world. For free men are like rubber balls: the harder they fall, the higher they bounce. Leading the British by this time was a man who had been bouncing all his life. Winston Churchill, who had tried for years to warn the world about Germany. Meantime, the situation that faced France was as nearly hopeless as a military situation can be. Two fifths of the French army was lost. There were fewer than 50 divisions left to defend a front almost 200 miles long, running from the northern end of the Maginot Line to the sea. And behind that thin front line, there were no reserves. The despairing people of Paris sent their children south, praying that some miracle would keep them from harm. The hopeless men of the French army, without adequate arms or equipment, braced themselves for the coming blow. The first blow fell on June 5th. The French resistance was determined, but by June 8th, the left flank army had been shattered, and a general withdrawal was ordered to the line of the Marne and the Seine. On June 9th, the German main attack came. Within two days, the German armored and motorized divisions roared out into the open terrain. With this breakthrough, the issue of the Battle of France was decided, and from that time on, there was official talk of an armistice. Now, what about the famous Maginot Line? Let's go back and take a look. On June 14th, the Germans launched two attacks against the Maginot Line. In both cases, penetrations were affected. But we must remember that this was against fortifications defended by men devoid of hope. In the meantime, Mussolini, now thinking it's safe, sent his divisions racing across the border. The hand that held the dagger has struck it into the back of its neighbor. Organized resistance in France was no longer possible. The government faced two alternatives: retire to North Africa and carry on from there, or give up the struggle. France's leaders were old and tired, and the oldest and most tired was Marshal Pétain, egged on by men like Laval, who saw in a German victory his chance for personal power. On June 16th, Pétain asked for an armistice. The news is carried to Hitler, who received this word of a great nation's fall in a characteristic manner. Also characteristic were his terms for the armistice. It must be signed in the coach where Marshal Foch met the defeated Germans in the last war. The French delegation arrives to pay the final price of French disunity. And the treachery of some of its leaders. The final price, a price that for centuries to come, the French won't forget. More than three fifths of their country was to be blacked out by a military occupation. The remainder was to be controlled by a French government acceptable to Hitler. A tax of 400 million francs a day was to be imposed on the French people to support the German army of occupation. Nearly two million French prisoners of war were to be taken into Germany, 
and kept there as hostages to work as slaves or rot of hunger, tuberculosis, or other diseases in concentration camps. Men deliberately and permanently separated from their families in order to decrease the French birth rate and thus eliminate France as a world power in future generations. French civilians, men, women, and children, must slave on farm or in factory for the Nazi master race or starve. There will be a class of subject alien races. We need not hesitate to call them slaves. French children were to grow up on such inadequate food that many would reach the age of 12 before they grew new teeth. And for any attempts to protest against these restrictions, thousands of innocent French civilians would be executed. This was the price the French were to pay as they signed the armistice. And the master of the master race must go to Paris to tour the streets of what was once the city of light. You notice no cheering crowds here to welcome in the new order. When the people of Paris come to the streets again, it is to hear the voice of dictators telling them what they must do, how they must live, what they must say, what they must think, telling them how to be slaves. Gone is the Republic of France. Gone is free speech and a free representative government. Gone is liberty, equality, fraternity. These are the French. With their ears, they listen. But their minds and their hearts, these are down on the Mediterranean where the battle colors of the regiments are being taken to Africa, out of the Nazi grasp. The people weep as their glory departs, for they don't as yet know that France has hope, a rallying point. Charles de Gaulle, a soldier in the great tradition of Foch, is not surrendering. He will continue to fight gathering about him loyal Frenchmen from all over the world to become the free French army, the fighting French. Yes, the people weep as they watch their colors go, not knowing that two years later, those same flags would again be unfurled in North Africa, alongside the Stars and Stripes, alongside the Union Jack. Once more, their leaders, General de Gaulle and the famous General Giraud, stand united in the common cause with the leaders of their allies. Once more, the red, white, and blue of France is raised on high. For out of the ashes of the defeat and the humiliation of France, her soul has been born again. <laughs>